on our study on the book of Exodus. Well, <clears throat> our last lesson, we asked the question, do you really want to be free? And the variations of those questions are, do you really want your prayers answered? Because sometimes we ask God for something and we don't really know what we are asking God for. For example, parents say, Lord, help us have a uh, family that is very God-fearing, respectful children. And yet they, are not, they pray that and they want that to happen. And yet they are not willing to teach their children the word of God. They are not willing to discipline their kids whenever necessary. So that means you are really not that serious regarding your prayer. Because when God answers the prayers, there are responsibilities that is placed upon those who are praying. So, now you are praying, and after praying so many times about the same thing, the answers that you are expecting for did not materialize. Or you are heartbroken, or you are disappointed. So people give up. So, in our study in Exodus, we'll, we're going to look at uh, this basic question. Why do people give up? Why do we have so, such great or phenomenal dreams? If you listen to kids about their dreams, phenomenal dreams. Why do, why do we give up? Considering that uh, if we analyze our dreams and goals, these are phenomenal dreams and goals. And they are really nice if they happen. But why do we give up? Right, DJ? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we will, we will start it up. The initial meeting of, Ma of Moses and Aaron with Pharaoh was very <laughs> discouraging. So Moses received this revelation from the Lord. He was, uh, he was standing in front of the burning bush. By the way, Moses saw the burning bush. He also heard the voice of God. Who else experienced that in the scriptures? They saw God in the fire and heard the voice of God. Who else experienced that? Can anybody tell me? Huh? Who else experienced that? The answer is really simpler than you think. <laughs> Who, God spoke to Moses in a burning bush and we say, Wow, if, if God can only speak to me in a burning bush, I will believe. And God spoke through the fire. Who, who else experienced that? The whole nation of Israel. God appeared to the whole nation of Israel through the pillar of fire, not only once, for 40 years. And then remember on the, on, on the mountain, they heard the voice of God. They heard it. So if you analyze it, what Moses experienced as an individual, the nation experienced as a community, you see? But different, different results and different, different, uh, different reaction. And so Moses met the elders and they saw Pharaoh and Pharaoh got upset and said, you, you guys are lazy. You, you just want to, uh, to, have a, to have more day off. And so he said, the quota on the bricks will be the same. But this time... We will never provide the straw. You look for the straw yourself. Now, I, I call that a very discouraging moment. You know, sometimes when we ask God for something, we imagine, our imagination can be very wild. We imagine that, that uh, we will just apply and the things will go as we planned or think about. And then when you approach the situation, it didn't materialize. You're having difficulty in your school. You prayed, Lord, may my professor give me favor. I'm going to ask for leniency. I'm going to ask for extension. You, want, you went to the professor instead of giving you extension. You have five more days. He made it three more days. And then you wonder, Lord, how come? Your boss is uh, upset with you and, say, and fuming accusations and saying, I'm going to get rid of you. So you prayed, Lord, I want favor from my boss that I will not be fired. You're supposed to be fired before the next payday. You have one week. You went to the boss, and the boss gets upset and say, you want me to get rid of you now? And then you, that's not what you expected. So what happened when the unexpected takes place contrary to what you're praying for? The 
person gives up. And there are too many people who just easily gives up. So let's look at this uh, passage now that we are going to consider. Let's start with identifying this unchanging God. Exodus chapter 6, starting on verse 2. Exodus 6, verse 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, telling him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God Almighty. But I was known to them by my name, the Lord. This is the Tetragrammaton, yod Hey vav Hey. okay? I am not known to them as, uh, as, uh, by the name, the Lord. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land they lived in as aliens. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are forcing to work as slaves. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, tell the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out of the forced labor of the Egyptians and rescue you from the slavery, uh, from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the forced labor of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses tell this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their broken spirit and hard labor. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go from, this, from his land. But Moses said in the Lord's presence, If the Israelites will not listen to me, then how will Pharaoh listen to me? Since I am such a poor speaker. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them commands concerning both the Israelites and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. Now, after this discouraging event, the first thing that the Lord told Moses is, I am the Lord. I am who I am. The Tetragrammaton. He is the unchanging God. Now, listen. <clears throat> our circumstances, our situations, events, happenings, human conditions, they can all change. I mean, we, we, we know how too many things changed during this COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, was, was that for a couple of months? We have, we have around, we only have the crew, right? Can you imagine this, this empty church? For around two months, something, something like that. And uh, people were, were asking, what will we do now? You know, are we going to go to church? But the restrictions are, and now we have a, a, another advisory. And so things changed. And sometimes when things like this change, we think God is like us. We think that God is surprised. He's not surprised. I mean, if God is God, he knew this before it happened. And uh, he's not surprised at all. And so God knew, actually Moses knew also, that Pharaoh will resist. And God said, I will harden his heart. So he knew. Perhaps he did not share it to the Israelites. I mean, how are you going to tell the Israelites, the Lord will deliver you? By the way, before he delivers you, Pharaoh will be upset. And he will resist. And he will fight, and he will do the following things. That will be very discouraging. And so, <clears throat> the first thing that God said after the people were discouraged, and they would not listen, and Moses was discouraged, and Aaron was discouraged, I am the Lord. You have not known me by this name, but this is my name. I am yod Hey bav Hey. you know. Uh, some pronounce it as Jehovah. But the first time that, that a four-letter name was given by God, I am, the, I am not changing. Listen, situations in our lives will keep on changing. They say the only thing that uh, is constant is change. But God is not, is not changing. He is the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the, the same God that Israel saw in Exodus, what the apostles saw during the times of Jesus, and he is still the same God. One of my professors, a Canadian a theologian, Dr. John Ruthven, you can download this book, The Cessation of the Charismata, because people were, were arguing that the moving of the Spirit had already stopped. So what he did is documented from the second century to the last century, because he's already retired, he's old, you know. Uh, so 21st century is not yet 
here when he made the documentation. Every century he documented the operation of the gifts of the Spirit in, from the second century up to the 20th century. It never stopped. Sometimes the voice is, is very uh, low and the manifestations are not that much, but he documented in every century the Lord kept moving. The Holy Spirit never left. It's us who begin to think that God is changing. That's why, for example, today, a lot of Christians have changed their theologies. Pastor Gino was just in my office, and he's, he's shocked at some of the changes, for example, that is happening even in school. In my seminary days, we call his school ultra-conservative. But now he said, I know what happened to the school. You know? Our situations change. They are always changing. And we think that because they are changing, God is changing. For some people, even the power of God changes. For some, God could no longer answer their prayers. God is no longer around. And for some people, he's dead. You know? So, how can that be? His covenant is also unchanging. What God promised to Israel before Pharaoh said no is still the same promise. Not because the situations or the circumstances in our lives says no, it doesn't mean it's no to God. God is not moved by our circumstances. It's moved by our faith, if we can believe. But a lot of us, I mean, for example, the, the, the college uh, students of our church years ago, you know, they have these dreams. They go to school. They encounter difficulties in, in a school, and they fail in one class, or their classmates, their friends move to another school. They all move to a different school. They keep changing courses. DJ was telling me that her roommate, both of them are uh, preparing to become a doctor, and her roommate in the last three years changed five courses, uh, five, five degrees, because she was, she was so challenged, um, she doesn't know what to do. You know, and so she changed courses five times. Because we think that God's answer to our prayers is determined by our circumstances. When situations change, you know, that's why, that's why we can't put our trust in man but only in God because he's never changing. God's compassion and hearing ears are unchanging. It's still the same. He can hear our groanings. Now, we may not be able to see him. We may not be able to understand him. Listen, your physical condition affects your soul, and it affects your spirit. When we get born again, what was transformed is our spirit. But we need to renew our minds. If we don't renew our minds and doesn't agree with our spirit, we'll have a problem. So now, with all of this, after they were rejected by the Pharaoh and given more hard labor, God says, I am unchanging. I didn't change my promises. So now, we ask the question, why do we give up then, if that is the case? Because in, in, in the study of the Bible, even in motivational speaking and in, in sermons, the most difficult thing really is applying what you hear. I think, I think we have enough success seminars, we have enough health. Can you imagine how many health gurus are around? I mean, every street corner, it seems like there's health guru. How come they say that it's still the most obese uh, society right now is American society. We have, we have some of the best teachers in, in health nowadays. How come it's like that? Because it's not the information, it's the application of the information. Because there can be so many discouraging things that will come your way. You know, you're, 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 you're trying to buy a house and somebody picked up the house earlier than you did. And you, when you look at the house, you say, whoa, that's what I like. And somebody pick it up. Yeah, so. These are so many things. So why do we give up? After God told them that he is unchanging, he proceeded to repeat to them his promised deliverance in verse 6. In verses 7 to 8, God also uh, said that he, was, he will be delivering them from forced labor or slavery. He's all, he also repeated that he's going to be their God. And he said, I will take you as my people. These are great promises, but... You know, if you are suffering, what's the use of those promises? Now, why is it that Israel did not listen? This is the answer. Number one, they have a broken spirit. Say a broken spirit. And number two, because of hard labor. Now, if we are not careful, these are the 
two things that can make us give up. Number one, it's a broken spirit. This is different from, from uh, this broken spirit is different from what God desires from us, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Let me look at that passage, Psalm 51, verse 17. Then we will define what this broken spirit is. Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and a humbled heart, O God. Now here, the Israelites gave up because they have a broken spirit and hard labor. Different Hebrew words. Okay, So a broken spirit in someone is what God desires. A spirit that is yielded to God. But verse 9 is different from what we read in Exodus 6. Verse 9 means this. When it says, the reason why they are not listening is because they have a broken spirit. That means their spirit are now inadequate or short. It's like uh, you, you are you're six feet tall. You want to lay down in a good bed. And the bed is four feet long. That's, that's annoying, right? Uh, me and my wife, we have, we have, a, uh, we have a queen-size bed where we sleep on. But sometimes she'll be fixing some things. And on the foot of the bed, there'll be some clothes there. And so I, I will lay down and, and, and I have to, to, to bend my knees because it's inadequate. You know? Have you ever sat in a car and there's no, there's no leg room? So I like my truck. There's more leg room in my truck than, than in, in, in a car. If, if there's no leg room, you... Have you, have you sat in a, in a jeep or in a car in the Philippines? For as long as this, there's an air, there will be a passenger, you know? I remember we were, we were leaving our missions uh, place. I don't know where we were. I think we were in Nueva, Nueva Biscaya. And uh, no, 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 we were in Ifugao. And somebody wants to ride along from Ifugao to one of the, the places. And Brother Willie and I look at each other. Wow, how are we going to say no? Because there's no space. But uh, we remind ourselves, you know, in, in, in the Philippines, if you can hold on to something, you hold on to that. But we feel be- it's inadequate. Now, you want, you want to stretch your leg, but you cannot stretch it. It's inadequate. This is what a broken spirit means. It means the, ne- the Israelites is still wants to be free. But they have no more room to move. They become inadequate. It also means they lose the strength. You know, you know, Jay, look, look at Jay, the, the one in the camera, bodybuilder. Hey, Jay, show yourself. Come on. <laughs> don't, don't, be, don't be embarrassed. He's got, he's got muscles, you know. Uh, so I, I, we, I asked for his help the other day because I'm breaking down. It's a, it's a small wall. It's 29 by 29 inches, but it's an 8 inch concrete. And, and we have, the room is so small. It's, it's good if you can get a sledgehammer and really walk the thing. But we have no room. We're, we're moving like this. You know? That's, that's a big wall. I already sliced the thing, but not, not sufficient. And so Ann says, call Jay, because Jay is, is very muscular. Jay was hitting the thing, and it's not moving. And he says, uh, and he says I feel so weak. Well, the, but he is strong, actually, a lot stronger than me. But he feels inadequate because there's no space and we are positioning ourselves. How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? You know, because there's just no space. And have you noticed sometimes you still want to fight? You run out of space. Have you seen Olympic uh, races like in swimming? You see this guy picking up speed, but he ran out of time. Because there's only five laps. He pick up a speed on four and a half laps. You fell short, inadequate. And we are like that. At first, we feel, we feel strength, and then we get discouraged. And then it's, it's, it seems like we are catching the second wind. And then just, just when you are picking up the second wind, the race is over. You know, the race is over. What, what for example, if you're trying to buy something, say buy a car. And it's, it's uh, being sold as a second hand. Good price. You want the car. You're short of $1,000. 
You ask somebody, can you help? Give $500. Man, $500 more. And then finally somebody says, tomorrow I have $500. You can buy the car. So you call the seller. You have been negotiating for five days. I've got the money. And said, oh, I'm sorry. I just sold it one hour ago. Inadequate. Oh, that, that's very discouraging. Moses saw the, 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 the fire. Moses saw, heard, heard the voice of God. And Aaron testified of the same thing, that God spoke to him. So the prophecies are there. Inadequate, you know. At this state, you are just worn out because of continuous oppression. You don't know the oppression is forced labor. Continuously. I don't know if you have, you have gotten uh, to that point. You are praying for something, but every time when it seems like the answer is coming, another problem comes. You're asking, Lord, I want to have promotion, you know. I, I, I really need a salary increase. You've got a salary increase. You're very happy. Praise God. And then you call your wife and, and say, I've got a raise. I'm a manager now. I'm, my boss is adding $20 an hour and says, oh, thank you, sweetheart. But your son just got hospitalized and you have no insurance. Just when you think you can breathe, something happened again. Now, that is not just one incident, one after the other. I remember uh, they were interviewing some people in, in New York uh, because of the COVID-19. And he said, hey, listen, we get the stimulus. We, we were able to breathe. But he said, COVID is not going away. So he said, we're waiting for the second stimulus. It, it didn't come. And then he said, the governor said we will continue to shut down and said, I understand. But he said this, hey, listen, this is my grandfather's business. This is my father's business. And it's now my business. He said, I'm 50 years old. I'm not going to start all over again. He said, how am I going to start all over again? He said, this is, this is our family's work. So he said, I'm going to brave it out. I'm going to open the, the company. And then the, the governor came up with uh, another order. You open that company, we're going we're gonna to penalize you. And so, like, like they're being suffocated. So now the medical community is saying, if this continues, the rate of suicide and other, and other possible cases will be very high. What is that suffocation? So, okay, you, you want, you're not giving up. You really don't want to give up. But you are just being suffocated. Okay, this is what Israel had felt. It broke their spirit. And because and it, was, they, they, it broke their spirit, they don't want to keep on fighting. Now, at this state also, you have lost sight of God who becomes your sufficiency. Hey, listen, it's very easy to say, God is my provider if you are, if you are well provided. What if it's no long, you're no longer well provided? Can you still say God is my provider? Now, maybe you can fast three days. Maybe you can fast one day. But boy, if you are missing your meals all the time, the oppression becomes too much. And whatever affects your body affects your soul. And it will affect your spirit. Now, coupled with that hard labor, remember, they were still meeting the brick quota without the straw. So now they're very tired mentally. Their soul is is worn out, and then their body is worn out. They were no longer resting. Their body is worn out. Their soul got worn out, then their spirit followed. Basically, what happened is they're just lo like walking dead. You know, th there are periods in our church history where people are very discouraged, and, and not everybody, of course, but certain people that you know, and they, you, you, can, you can make a, a storyline, you know, a storybook. When they first came to church or when God blessed them, they come to church joyful. They are waiting. They are greeting everybody. Hey, how are you doing? Praise the Lord. You know? Then something happened. And you see their countenance begin to change. From very happy to... Sometimes during worship, they are very expressive. And then from being very expressive to... And then you see them folding their hands. And then you see them just sitting down. And then sometimes you observe this. They just sit, it's like walking dead. Now these are Christians. 
These are born again Christians who love the Lord. But they, you can see life is being zapped. It's being taken out from them. That tells us what the enemy is doing to us. He tries to break us to surrender and to give up. This is what oppression does. You know the difference between possession and oppression. Possession is coming from the inside. Oppression is coming from the outside. In this world, you shall have tribulation. That is outside pressure. You will be pressed. You will be pressed. I was, was watching a Chinese movie the other day, and this, this tyrant, he was not given a chair, so he decided to sit on one of the servants because he can kill him, you know. The, the guy is muscular. He said, I'm going to sit on you because you forgot my chair. And he is strong. He thought he can endure it. So he sat on him. Well, he thought it's going to be a couple of minutes. But there was a speech by a politician. And his, his elbows, his knees began to buckle. And he was shaking. He was sweating until he collapsed. Why? Constant pressure. Constant pressure. I mean, you remember, brother, really? Say, who, who can carry this? Of course, this is 16 or 17 uh, fluid ounce. This is very light. Try to hold it like this for one day. See if you will last. You will not last. Because the continuous pressure makes anything unbearable. Okay? If one problem after the other, it makes the condition unbearable. This is what the enemy does. Remember one of his names is Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, the unceasing, frantic labor. He never stops. You can only fight this by, by finding strength in God, in, in God. But then the question, how do you find your strength in God? Because people make it very impossible to achieve it. Oh, just, just lift your hands. You're very tired already. Just lift your hands to the Lord, worship Him. And everything will go away. Have you ever tried to worship when you're tired? What happens when you worship when you're tired, DJ? Fall you fall asleep. I don't care if you're standing up. I have seen worshipers. That's why I don't like the, the platform chair because you see everybody. I have seen worshipers. They're very tired. And, and, and they literally are going like that. How do I know? It happened to me a couple of times. You're just very tired and just you're standing up there and Hallelujah. What happened, you know? <laughs> You're just worn out because of continuous activity. So how do you find strength in God? You know when you find strength in God, it's actually more practical than you think. And that's what the Bible is. You can only fight this by finding strength in God <clears throat> against oppressive actions to the point that oppressors will never own you. Now, the same situations, by the way, happen in Nehemiah. Remember, Nehemiah was supposed to build the walls of Jerusalem, which is the picture of the soul of Jerusalem. Ezra had finished the temple, the spirit of Jerusalem, and now the wall. Okay? When Nehemiah was given, was given uh, access to the forest uh, resources for timber, and all kinds of preachers to build the wall. But there are two enemies of Israel. The name, number one is San Balat. The second one is Tobiah. Okay? Uh, San Balat and Tobiah. Boy, they were, they were oppressing Israel. They were mocking Israel. They were even saying, you know, if a dog jumps over that wall, it will collapse. They were just insulting. And everybody was tired. And then you remember at one point, the enemies were, were trying to attack so Nehemiah says, well, we have no extra help. So what did he do? On one hand, you have a javelin. Then you're carrying work. And then change shift. That is continuous. Now that is very oppressive. Yeah, you have to remember when, when they work back then, they, they, don't, they don't say, okay, get, get a cinder block. They're cutting stones. But very difficult. And then there is a threat. Oh, if somebody is attacked on one side of the wall, blow the trumpet and the rest will fight. By the way, after you fight, go back to work. It's, it's very tiring. So, they were making very little progress also. Guys, do you notice, when you are physically worn out, you are no longer going to be productive. 
The other thing, aside from being worn out, that you are no longer going to be productive, is when you get old. You know, believe me, I know that now. You know, when I was when I was younger, we'll we'll do carpentry work. Man, I can do this now. No more. My, I I feel my knees giving up, and my son James here is laughing at me. You know, I was looking at how I work right now. I says, man, I when I was a little bit younger, I can do a lot more than that. But you're being worn out. There's constant pressure on your body. That's why you get old, even in the Bible, your job changed. But here, Nehemiah, they were making little progress. Were they praying? Yes. Have you ever prayed for something and after much prayer, little progress? That's what's happening to them. They were fighting for their lives at the same time. Then the law was read to them. When they read the law, they heard all the violations they did. The more they get discouraged. You know? So you are worn out. You work overtime. And you heard somebody says, find strength in God. You come to church, and the pastor preach, and it pinpoint your sin. The more oppressed you got. You, know? <laughs> you thought you're going to come to church and rejoice, and you, 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 got, you feel oppressed. Man, I thought I'm going to go to church, and, and the pastor just talked about my sin. Did anybody tell him? You know? And so you, get, you went after the pastor, you get upset. The pastor doesn't even know you, you see. So that's what happened. They were losing it. Oh, then the Lord gave them the solution. They felt like giving up. Then the Lord gave them the solution. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Then he, he said to them, Go and eat. Say eat. Say it again. You know how practical God is? We will tell a person who is discouraged, pray fast. God says, no, no, go eat. I like God. <laughs> go and eat. Not only go and eat. Go and eat what is rich. Drink what is sweet. And send portions to those who have nothing prepared. Since today is holy to our Lord, do not grieve because the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know what Nehemiah did? Gave them a day off. They were very tired. They were very oppressed. Gave them a day off and throw them a feast. And said, don't, don't only eat, eat the best. Eat what is rich. That's why I like uh, a Filipino feast, you know. You go to a Filipino feast, boy, everything is there. Including what you don't want to eat, it's still there, you know. Uh, but it's everything that, 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 you, will, that, that, that you will like. Since today is holy to our God, do not grieve because the joy of the Lord is strength. How do you get the joy of the Lord? Look at this. People say you pray, you worship. God says, no, you eat. It's easy to be joyful when your stomach is full. Isn't that practical? Have you been sad and somebody gave you food? Whoa, that's, that's something else, you know. <laughs> Joseph is asking me, Papa, what's the best food that you like? I said, Louisiana food. I, I think the best food in the U.S. is in Louisiana. Man, you, you eat their food. You will forget your problems. You, know? you will forget your problems. They have good, good food. I like going to Louisiana just for their food. <laughs> but have you been very, very tired? And then you go home, you want food, and what do you have? Pangat, ayos. You know? You get old food, the more discouraged you get. So this is how practical God is. You're tired? You feel oppressed? I'll tell you what. Number one, take a day off. Number two, eat good food. And then at the end of that, he says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. How does his strength return to us? Now you will understand why one of the major issues in the Ten Commandments is the Sabbath day, your day off. You need time to recoup. You know, I, I, have, seen, I have seen members of this church, you know, we, we, you, you guys attend on one of our services or more, and you feel very spiritual. I'm going to go just to worship. But you have not slept. And so I've seen people sit down and they're, they've never really slept. And they struggle. 
They are falling asleep. And they rebuke the devil. In Jesus' name, come out. <laughs> Nobody is going to come out. Yeah. Eliza, it seems like you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so you rebuke it. In Jesus' name, come out. And no devil is coming out. Why? Because you're just tired. You are just tired. D DJ, uh, because of so many homeworks that she has, from time, now she's, she's studying in my office, uh, in, in my attic. And, and she'll, she'll tell you, I'll be studying and I'll be very tired and I'll, I'll, I will not brave my way through those books and reading. If I'm tired, I'm sleepy. I'll, even in my office, I'll, I'll, I'll tell DJ, DJ, I'm very sleepy. Wake me up after 20 minutes. Because you're tired. What, what are you going to do? And so we pile up. Have you noticed when you are reading and you're very sleepy, how much do you understand? Nothing. Yeah. And this is how practical God is. Sometimes we think we should fast even more. Well, you're already tired, you're getting sick. It's not time for that. Sometimes if we observe the day of rest, God gave us six days to work. It didn't say you work eight hours a day. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says while, while there is light, because darkness comes, Jesus said, when no man can work. So God is not saying you work for eight hours a day. That's human law, okay? But it says you have to sleep, and then you have to give yourself a day off. People think that resting is taking a vacation. How many of you have taken a vacation after the vacation? You need vacation from your vacation. We went to, uh, and, and with two more families, right? We went to Florida at one time. My, my wife likes the rides, and I, I hate rides. I, I just don't like rides. And uh, they were lining up in, in Disney World. You know how the lines are, are, are long. And I, I think, who is the baby during that time? James. John or James? James. James, was, James was a baby, and he was in a stroller, and my wife wants to go on the rides. I don't want to go on, on the rides. So who watches James? <laughs> Me. Now the line sometimes is one hour. You know how, how bad it is to wait with James on the stroller for one hour? And then the wife returns and says, I'm going to go for the next ride. <laughs> I remember Larem was, was with us. I told Larem, I'm just, I'm just going to go to the washroom, okay? C can you watch James? And said, okay, we are okay. And, and what he doesn't know is I want to stroll because I'm, I'm just tired. So I use, so I stroll and I returned after several minutes. I was looking at Larem, Larem is looking. And then when he saw me, yes, could you say, you know, but he was already oppressed. <laughs> you see, after two days, my wife got a four day pass. I told my wife, I'm not going anywhere. But we came to, to Florida for vacation. I said, vacation for you, not for me. I said, I'm so tired. He said, he, and she said, but we've got a four-day pass. It's very expensive. I said, who cares? What if I die? You know, you're going to finish the four-day pass. You're dying already. And so I decided, I'm not going anywhere. And she said, we've got to go. I said, no, I'm not going. When my kids heard that, they said, Papa is not going. We're not going also. It turned out they were also tired. It will wear you out. Yeah. And this is what we neglect. We have, you want to find the joy of the Lord so that you will not give up. You've got to give yourself a break. You know, you, you, have, you have to give. Your body affects your mind, affects your feeling. And we ignore it all the time. You know, Jay, Jay is very hardworking. Sometimes he, 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 he will say, Pastor Sam, I'm going to help you. I'm going to look at my wife and say, but, but he, he's, he's coming from work. I'm going to help you, you know. And look what happened to him. He got sick. <laughs> That's what happened. Your body can only take so much. And in as much as we explain body, soul, and spirit, they are actually meant to be one. And they are one. And sometimes you say, well, this is just my body. Don't do that. Your body is holy to the Lord. You're supposed, in fact, He will glorify it. Not only do you have to give it rest. From that passage, you've got to feed your body well. Are you listening? Eat good food. I'm telling you, there's nothing more refreshing than eating good food. You know? That's why if Joseph is watching, 
just a plexit when they take a short vacation in Oklahoma. Because I go take him to restaurants, you know. I don't want Joseph to cook for me. I don't want him to cook for me, you know. <laughs> I don't want to be oppressed. So, <laughs> so I'll tell him, let's, let's go to a restaurant. I'll, I'll, I'll tell him, what, what do you want? Boy, he's, he's happy and we're, we're, we're both happy. Why? Because not only do you have to give your body rest, feed it well. And then it says, here, after you do that, make sure that nobody is neglected. They said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's when you will begin to access the joy of the Lord. Now, there's another guy. Look at this prophet, hardworking prophet. Name is Elijah, right? Name is Elijah. Killed 300 prophets of Baal. After that, Jesse will get upset. I'm going to kill you. He ran for his life. He was not scared of Ahab. He was not scared of the 300 prophets of Baal. Why did he run from Jezebel? You know why? He spent so much spiritual energy. Have you ever prayed and after you prayed you're so tired? It's taxing because you're spending spiritual energy. So he was very tired and said, Lord, I'm going to die. There's, there's nobody else except me. Nobody else serving you except me. He was doing a pity party. And he, he was running and he was very tired. And he fell asleep. What happened? God sent an angel of the Lord. He's going to do a 40-day fast. God sent an angel of the Lord to encourage him to give him strength. What did the angel of the Lord do? Baked him some cake. You see how practical it is? Sometimes somebody is very discouraged or lay hands on him. Why lay hands? Ask the person, when was the last time you ate? Yesterday. Bring him to a restaurant. And I'll, I'll tell you, tell him, I'm going to bring you to a good restaurant. You'll see smile right away. Really? I have not eaten this yesterday. The angel of the Lord baked him some cake and he fell asleep again. After he fell asleep, I don't know how many hours he fell asleep, he's hungry again. The angel baked him another set of cakes. And that sustained him for another 40 days. Supernatural food. You see, sometimes we think that spirituality is, is uh, something that is unreachable. No, there are a lot of practical things that, that, that you can do. Here, taking a Sabbath celebration, a day off. Why? Because you allow your body to recover. It gives you time. When you allow your body to recover, it gives you time to taste and see that the Lord is good. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. But if you're super tired, you're not going to be able to taste and see that the Lord is good. You're not going to enjoy it. You know, I've, I've read a lot of books regarding breaking families. This guy will be working and this woman will be working. We're going to build, establish a family. And they are busy about, concerned about paying their bills, education, etc., etc. And they thought, they compared themselves with others. They thought, I don't have what others have. And they begin to be oppressed. Until one day, they were able to relax and sit down, and they look at their family, and they say, whoa, I've got a wonderful family. You see, when you recover physically, yes, you work hard, but when you allow your body to recover physically, it gives you time to taste and see the Lord is good. It tells you also that, that you will not die simply because you take a day off. People sometimes have a very high estimate of themselves. They think the world is going to die because they're taking a day off. Oh, what's going to happen to my family? What's going to happen to my company? Listen, that company was there before you were hired. It's, it's going to be okay. You know? Well, I'm a, a, key, a key employee now in the company. That's what you think. You will get fired and the company will keep going on. Now, there are some key positions, of course. But listen, you've got to learn how to take care of yourself. It tells you also that your life actually gets better because you celebrate the day oppressed. When you celebrate the day oppressed also, you get to enjoy what God is giving to you. If you're working and working and working and working, my, my brother frequent Japan before because of radar engineering, and he told me this, he said, the most hard-working hard, hard people that I've met are the Japanese. And, and, and some of them are getting sick. I said, how so? He said, when their boss gives them a goal for that day, you will finish this today. He told me, his co-workers, the Japanese, they will, they will not eat lunch. They'll do everything to finish the job. They're getting sick. Yeah, they're getting sick. And this is sometimes what, what, what we do. 
But it actually, life gets better when you, when you actually learn how to take off. Okay? Uh, maybe I'm preaching to myself also, but learn how to take off. Listen, do not allow your spirit to be broken because of so many things that are going on around you. That we become invested in these things even if we cannot do anything. Access the strength of God. Remember during the recession, I, I like t- telling this story, a, uh, a businessman committed suicide. Because in that recession, I think within one week, he lost something like $20 million. So he thought, this is the end of, of, my, of my life. I lost $20 million in one week. He's a millionaire. Committed suicide. So the people around him were so upset. So, of course, they have to fix, his, they have to find his will and see how much he has. When he committed suicide, his net worth was still over $100 million. Over $100 million. And you committed suicide because you lost $20 million. It's a lot of money. Most of us will never see that money. But what happened? He lost perspective. He got so invested in, in, during the recession that... Remember, in, in, I think it was 1995, during the heat wave here in Chicago, they found an old couple dead because of heat. So they were cleaning their house. They lift the mattress. There's something like $72,000 under the mattress. They were so scared they will lose money. They were not turning on their AC. They died. They forgot th- th- these things. There are so many things going on around us today. I think, I think it's important that we learn how to take a step backwards and say, hey, what's, what's going on? Some, some of you students are so disappointed with your, with, your, with your school because online learning is not as much as actual learning. I know how many heart attacks my wife could have had every morning. <laughs> you know, she would say, is, is James awake? Is Joel awake? And the class is 8.30. It's 8.31 and Joel is still <laughs> sleeping, you know. <laughs> and Joel is very thankful to God. He doesn't have to brush his teeth right away. Nobody can smell it, you know. But, but it's, it's giving stress to, to my wife. Well, Pastor, is it giving me stress? It's not really giving me, <laughs> it's not really giving me stress, it's giving stress, stress to my wife. But uh, there's just a million things going on right now. Learn how to find strength in God. Remember this, take a day off. You know. Take care of your body well. Access the strength of God. Now, all of these things, like what Mama Mary Simo used to tell us, all of these things, listen, these two shall pass. We'll wake up one morning, they're gone. Don't lose your life over this. God knows what he's doing. Amen? (laughs) Let's all stand.